All right, I believe we're on page 28 of your notes on specific concepts. We looked at two weeks ago on the general considerations on the views of sanctification, the Keswick model, uh, the Nazarene or Wesleyan uh, model of perfectionism, and then the biblical model of the, the cycle of continued repentance through the Christian life. This is now in the area on page 28, specific concepts. Let me just read this first paragraph here. The biblical counselor must possess a deep theological understanding of guilt, repentance, forgiveness, and replacement in order to help people change biblically because these concepts are so central to the doctrine of sanctification. Satan and man's sinful flesh will work overtime to distort them. And you, I mean, I should have brought in some self-help books written by some uh, Christian psychologists on these topics of forgiveness and guilt. And it's not taken from exegesis. It, you know, it's forgive yourself, forgive God, uh, those kind of concepts. But let's first of all take a look at the term guilt because of a, a lot of teaching today on the uh, false guilt, that there's false guilt out there. And there is a war against guilt, which is a result of sin. And I'm not going to go over the various examples that Dr. MacArthur uh, uses in The Vanishing Conscience. That's a tremendous book uh, in dealing with the conscience guilt but explanations for the effects of guilt. Here's what ten, people tend to, to go to blaming uh, other things. No one can deny that depression, conflict, hatred, greed, hedonism, and other problems are rampant in our society. But they're explained away by the following environment. Here's where you get into the whole issue of it's outside, it's social conditions. That's what's made me, that's what's messed me up. A dysfunctional society, dysfunctional family. Uh, so you shouldn't feel bad because of society. It's sort of uh, almost Freudian in the sense of uh, his super ego that that's what's messed you up. And that goes back even to the Proverbs, back into Ezekiel 18 of the proverb of the day where people said the parents ate sour grapes and that's why the children's teeth is set on edge. There's blame shifting on parents and the Lord addresses that very clearly in that passage that that is that proverb will no longer be used in in that day sickness now this is the whole area of uh, illnesses everyone is sick rather than sinful and uh, they'll have some label that they'll use for themselves usually taken out of the uh, diagnostic and statistical manual Heredity, that it's genetic, and you get into family systems approach, and it takes 10 years to develop a schizophrenic. So they're going to go back in genetics, and they'll be looking at you're depressed and have uh, you're manic depressive because your grandmother was, and then your mother, and it's a, a genetic link is what they're trying to assess. So you're not to blame. You're still a victim. Every one of these is you're a victim. False guilt. That's an interesting phrase. You'll find it in various writings, even with uh, Christian self-help books. People will say, they'll go in for counseling and say, I really feel bad. I feel guilty about such and such. And they'll hear the term, that's false guilt. That's not true guilt, that's false guilt. And then from there, it's keep doing it and you won't feel so bad. That's down there in a desensitization type therapy where if you feel bad, uh, if you're cheating on your spouse, uh, that's healthy for you. That's what they, some would say. And keep doing it and you won't feel so bad. Now, <laughs> uh, the Bible calls that what? Searing your conscience. Now, that's deadly. There really is no such thing as false guilt. All guilt is real. Now, you may have some unbiblical standards that you're violating, which is really true guilt. And this is where you get into the weaker conscience issues, where a person says, you know, I, just, I feel guilty going to a movie. 
because I was trained and brought up that it's all sinful, it's all the world. So if I go into a movie theater, I'm sinning. Well, I don't know that you could prove that from Scripture, but that's their conscience is programmed that way, and if they violate it, they are sinning. And it is true guilt, even with an unbiblical standard, or at least supersedes God's standard. So all guilt is real. And what you, what you want to do is help people with their standards. Is it a biblical standard they're violating? They need to repent. Is it a unbiblical standard? It, it supersedes God's word. Then you want to re-educate them. And that was Paul's point to the weaker brother. Educate, re-educate their conscience to God's law, God's word. But don't violate your conscience. It's our guard, not our guide. Uh, shame, shame, the term shame is, uh, runs right with guilt. It's usually the effect of being guilty. You sin, you violate God's word, then shame kicks in. It's related to uh, our sin. It's a result of sin. It's not the cause of sin. And sometimes in Scripture, it's just a synonym for guilt. Efforts to eliminate it. Some people would say more sin. I already mentioned that with desensitization therapy. Chemicals. Uh, that'll silence uh, some guilt. You won't even know what you're feeling if you're on certain drugs. And you could even add in there electrical convulsive therapy, ECTs, with short-term memory loss as one of the major side effects. You know, people are having trouble remembering things, and it's to shock them, especially in depression, so that they don't feel so bad. And um, sometimes I wonder, you know, on some of that... Um, Electrical convulsive therapy, you know, if you did that on King David, you know, you could just imagine him saying, who's Uriah? Who's Bathsheba? I mean, there, there are certain things that you begin to say, Lord, when people come in and they have been through several treatments, uh, I can only trust God in his grace to that whatever damage has been done, that uh, nothing is still too hard for God uh, to do and recover what needs to be recovered even in memory. Blame shifting, that, that's a, a way to eliminate the effect of guilt, at least as far as our contemporary culture. Blame shifting, it's not my fault, it's somebody else's fault. Self-esteem, as if that is the root of man's problems, as Dr. Dobson uh, proposes, it's the root of man's problems, a low self-esteem, or self-gratification. You feel bad, you know, just go party, go find pleasure, become a hedonist. Focus on yourself and forget God and other people. And this is just attempts to eliminate guilt. So let's look at the biblical understanding of guilt. And again, this is a sort of a surface treatment. We can't go too much in depth in this. But the definition of guilt, it's a legal liability or culpability to punishment a legal liability or culpability to punishment. You break a law, you're guilty. And the fact there, it's the fact of guilt versus the feeling of guilt. You may not feel guilty, but you may be guilty. You don't wait around for feelings. It's if you violated God's word, a standard, or your own standards, you're guilty, whether you feel like it or not. You know, and it, you have to kind of watch the way some people operate. Uh, let's say the, the speed, the uh, miles per hour is 35, the uh, zone, and you're going 90. And you think, man, I feel, I feel bad. I'm going 90, it's 35, residential area here. I, um, so you slow down to 60. Man, I feel so much better. You're still guilty. You know, and, and people will do that. They might be to an extreme in sin and back up and say, I'm not doing what I used to do. Well, that's, that's good, but you're still guilty. I remember talking with one guy who left his wife for another woman. And uh, when confronted with a sin, he says, all right, 
I'll stop with that other woman. But I'm not going back to my wife. And he felt very good about that, that he was going to stop uh, the adulterous relationship. And he just, you can just tell he, by his expression, it was just, oh, you know, yes, I will no longer be involved with her, but I'm not going back there, and I feel so much better. Well, you're still guilty. You're st it's still wrong. So be careful of that fact versus feeling. Uh, number two there, the idea of false guilt it's not a good term uh, because guilt is real. Anytime a person says they feel guilty, it's because they usually are guilty. And it's up to us to help them with what's their standard, reasons for that guilt. Dealing with it, we must never minimize the fact of guilt. Uh, and I'm not going to go through all those points there. Uh, when a person says something, they feel guilty, they... Um, don't minimize that. Letter B, we must never minimize the feeling of guilt or underestimate the effect of guilt. And Psalm 32 is a great passage where David talks about the effects of guilt in his life. He couldn't sleep at night. His bones ached. Uh, he was restless. Uh, those are all effects of guilt, of sin not dealt with. The warning light that reveals guilt is the conscience that God has given every human being a conscience and you know the term itself means to know with it's defined as a soul reflecting on itself it's the internal law court and it's as only as good as it's programmed to be biblically and again you don't let your conscience be your guide but it is your guard. It's the warning light that goes off. Don't violate it. But the conscience is only as good as it's educated biblically to be. Because some people will say, this is sin, that's right, that's wrong, and they may be wrong biblically. And again, I would just encourage you towards that vanishing conscience. If you haven't read that, that's a good book to read. And have people read in your church who are struggling with guilt in their conscience, some with oversensitive type consciences, some with sort of deadened consciences. On page 30, uh, some variations of conscience referred to in Scripture. You find terms like a seared conscience, an untrained conscience. Again, Bringing the whole counsel of God to bear and help that individual is what's needed. An overactive conscience. And again, this is where we believe that a desire, thought, or action is morally wrong when the Bible does not actually condemn it. And you find people who want everything black and white, including wisdom issues. You know, where it may be more wise or less wise. No, it's got to be sin or not sin. And they struggle in churches. And they'll, they'll cause you some, some grief in a church because they mean well, but everything is sin or not sin. And in churches we know, and even in the Christian life, there's a lot of wisdom, a lot of uh, leeway in wisdom areas where you just say, well, for me, I, I think biblically it's more wise to do this, less wise. And you know, it's a sin or not sin. Black and white, on-off switch. And um, they'll push, they mean well, but you have to help them here with an overactive conscience to help them look at Scripture and be okay with wisdom areas. And then you have the biblical conscience, which is clear and clean, Paul talks about. The solution to uh, guilt is Repentance. It's forgiveness through repentance. God must remove the guilt of our sin through his appointed means of repentance. Let's take a look at that on page 31. And you're working on uh, repentance. I hope you are. Uh, the word repent basically means to turn or to change. It's not just a change of mind, but a complete change of life. 
of heart as well as behavior. It's a complete 180 degree turn. And repentance is a necessary component of genuine conversion. And unsaved people must turn from sin, which is the state of self-rule that they have lived in as their own Lord and Master. Another good reference there is 2 Corinthians 5, 9. Uh, I'm sorry, um, 2 Corinthians 5, 15, where uh, we no longer live for ourselves, but for Christ. Is that right? Some of you who are, I think it's 2 Corinthians 5, 15, that he died for all, that they who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. See, it was self-rule, self-living for self, now it's living for Christ. And repentance is necessary. And it remains continually necessary after conversion. Not for your position with Christ, but for the communion with Christ, for a believer. Let me repeat that. Repentance isn't needed again for uh, your position or union with him, that's already set and sealed uh, for eternity. But repentance is necessary after conversion for communion in your walk with Christ to grow. Saved persons must turn from sins, which are the specific symptoms of the lingering disease called the flesh, or whatever you want to call that, unredeemed humanness or sin principle within or in Romans 7. All true human repentance has reference to a turning from the state or occurrence of sin and turning to God for forgiveness and renewal. Scripture often alludes to a false repentance that does not actually bring forgiveness. And hopefully you'll be looking at that, the, the sorrow according to the world that typically goes into the area of penance, a uh, works righteousness. What do I have to do? Jumping through hoops tearing the outward garment but not the heart. That kind of thing is very common. So we must understand some elements and effects and examples of repentance. Some elements that are listed there is there is a comprehension. Like God's truth must be known about the matter. We must understand his word and what it says about sin, what it says about our Savior, before we can truly repent. You won't even acknowledge your sin correctly if you don't have God's truth on the matter. Confessing, sometimes it's used synonymously with repentance, but confessing is a twofold nature. An inward confession, where you are acknowledging and saying the same thing that God says about it. And then you get into also acknowledging it verbally, especially if you've sinned against another individual. So we're acknowledging it and agreeing with God about the nature of our sin. Proverbs 28, 13, if you uh, cover your sin, you will not prosper. But if you acknowledge it, confess it, and forsake it, you will find mercy. And Proverbs 28, 13, yes. And number one there, it says the Greek word came from a change of mind. I thought if we said that it wasn't a change of mind. No, the, the term itself, metanoia, um, if you just take the meaning of the word, it means that, but the concept is not just a change of mind. And I think that's what you'll find as you look at uh, the various terms uh, in the Hebrew and metanoia, is be careful of taking a word that and develop a theology on just the meaning of the term itself rather than the concept of it in Scripture. <laughs> All right, there's also a choosing that is involved in repentance, uh, not only a, a, a renewal in your thinking, but a choice within. True repentance always includes a willful resolve to not repeat the sin. And you see that as well in 2 Corinthians 7, where a person uh, regrets um, ever sinning. They want to turn. There's a zeal to do what's right and a choice. 
the effects of true repentance. Although repentance itself is an inward turning that takes place in the heart and mind, it inevitably leads to change in other areas of a person's life. It's the total package. And I think if, if you've already started doing work on that, you'll see that. Repentance is a total change. It's not just a change in your thinking, it's a change in your behavior, your will, direction. If it is not accompanied or followed by such effects when they are appropriate, it is not real repentance. It's a false one that fails to bring forgiveness. Not forgiveness in a positional, relational sense with God, uh, if you're his child, but it will affect the communion. All of our sins have been paid for, so it's not affecting our position and union, but it will affect your communion, just like it does in a human relationship. You sin against your spouse if you're married, and you don't have to get remarried. It's not a divorce over this, but it will affect your communion. And it's the same, it's a parental type of relationship that goes on uh, between God and us, his children. And that's why there needs to be continual confession and repentance on a daily basis. Uh, as Peter found out, just that constant foot washing. Uh, not a bath, but a continual cleansing every day to commune closely with the Lord. So that's the uh, effect it needs to change outwardly, a, a change within resolve, and then it leads to change without. And while you're dealing with this day in and day out in church ministry, people who are sinning, caught in sin, turn, you know, they come in and say, I have been in sin. All right, let's talk about repentance. Do you understand what God says about your sin and, and what needs to be put on in place of it? And now you're going to start looking, what, what's going to happen about fruit? What's going to manifest itself in their life? And that's why as you deal with 2 Corinthians 7, the, those elements there are going to be very helpful for you as sort of a gauge. Is repentance happening here in this person's life or is it not? And it's a process in some matters. Uh, it's not a process in outward adultery. You know, it's not that it was 10 people last week, it's five this week. You're not looking like that, but in some areas, it is a process, like anger, uh, inward lust, may be a process of repentance. They're working, putting off, and putting on when you're dealing with hard attitudes. It's different than major weighty commissions of sin. A little different. So the effects of true repentance. Restitution. Now that applies when the repentant sinner uh, has obligations to the offended party. You know, if someone in your church has embezzled money from someone else in your church or anyone else, and they're repentant, they need to repay it. Restitution. This includes, includes both an outward confession and a willingness to accept the consequences of their sin. I remember one... Uh, a young woman who was bouncing checks in one state. Maybe I mentioned this to you already. And um, she left the state, went to another state. And um, the Lord saved her. But she didn't take care of uh, her past, um, writing checks and bouncing them all over the place in a certain city. And so every time she went to her apartment complex and saw the police there or anywhere near there, just a paralyzing effect of guilt, of uh, are they here for me? Have they caught me? Have they found where I'm at? And so we had to work with her to find out where uh, from the bank, the police uh, department in the other state, and they took care of it. The bank wrote it off. The police said, we, we're not, it's, it's over. It's been so many years. We're, and they dropped it off, but she needed to do that to clear her conscience. And that was, uh, but she, there was a willingness to accept consequence. She was ready to go back to jail, if that's what it meant. Willing to pay things off, if that's what it meant. That was a repentant heart. 
Then there's reconciliation. When our sin has resulted in a broken relationship with another, true repentance will cause us to do whatever we can to transform the conflict into a peaceful and edifying friendship. Uh, this is where you get into the whole area of reconciliation and restoration, especially in relationships. There have been a few times in uh, church ministry where it's difficult when there's been adultery, repeated adultery, and the person's under church discipline, they, they, they repent, uh, the guilty individual repents, but there's been several adulterous situations. And so now there's been a separation between the husband and the wife, and he says, I'm repentant, and it, working with him, and the wife says, I'm glad he is, but he's not coming back home. This is not going to happen. And that's tough. And you should be really careful in, in pastoral ministry. You don't turn and say, well, all right, we'll start church discipline on you that you won't take him back. Those are some tough, weighty issues, uh, especially in that area when technically uh, she could have pursued a divorce. There was a period of time in there where she could have pursued it. Old Testament, we would just be doing a funeral for him. Uh, but because he's alive, he's repentant, it's the desire of the church leaders that God gets the glory and this becomes a real trophy of God's grace, but there are certain situations where the person says, it's not going to happen. I can't, I can't even imagine trying to work through the issues of he was involved with so many different people. Sometimes it's the same sex, homosexual relationships, and they just say, I can't, I can't. I'm glad he's repentant, hope he continues to grow. But um, it's over and starts pursuing divorce. And we've had a few instances like that here at this church. And you just have to get the counsel of all of the, the elders talking at an elder meeting on does she have grounds to pursue this or not? And each case has to be presented and investigated. But those are some tough calls. And there have been times where they've said, yeah, well, we're not going to pursue discipline on her if she sets out to divorce him. You know what was interesting in one of those cases is that he seemed repentant and in a few months living with someone else. Uh, so you kind of, uh, maybe she picked up, this one particular spouse picked up on I don't, I don't buy this. I mean, you think he's repentant, great, but I don't, I don't, I don't see it. Lived with him, don't see it. So those are tough. You push, the goal is reconciliation and restoration, uh, if at all possible. And Romans 12 comes in, 18, verse 18 there in your notes. Live at peace with all men as much as depends on you. And there are times when that's, that is the goal, as much as depends on you. It may not be that the other person will uh, work at reconciliation. Uh, regret, true repentance, may not always be accompanied by emotions, but in many cases, a feeling of sorrow collaborates with other evidences and points to a real change in thinking. Uh, there is a sorrow. How someone displays that, some people may weep and weep. Some pers uh, other people may just be silent but they're sorrowful, and you have to be careful of not measuring it with tears. Uh, you have examples of true repentance in Psalm 51 and 2 Corinthians 7, and you're working through that, so I'm not going to spend um, the time there. What you're really looking for uh, when ministering to uh, someone who has been in sin is first, vertically, it's the light on. <laughs> Uh, have they looked at the scriptures? They know what they did was sin before a holy God. They, they have their eyes on God, not other people. What's everyone else think? It's against thee and thee only. Psalm 51, I think it's verse 4. Against thee and thee only have I sinned. They have their eyes on God, and in the mirror of his word, they see what they did and how this was a, a grievous sin against God. 
Then they're going to look at their sin, and God's word will instruct them about the sin and the damage it's done and the, the hideousness of it uh, against the person that they, they've sinned, and they're going to say, I'm turning my back on that, and now they're going to turn and face the right and the righteous way of what they should be doing now by God's help. So it's a vertical before God. It's looking at the sin and saying, no more. Now I'm going to get very uh, uh, aggressive in my pursuit of God and his way and what's right. And I'll do whatever the Lord wants me to do. Correct, take whatever consequences. And that's a whole heart uh, change that comes out into actions, putting off, mortifying the deeds of the flesh by the help of the Holy Spirit and putting on what's right. If you don't see that happening, there's a good reason to question at that point whether they're really repentant. It's a, that's what should be going on daily with us. But let's go into the area of forgiveness. This is like a landmine. Uh, the whole topic of forgiveness, what is it? Primarily, the term itself, a fiamme, means to forgive or send away, release, let go. So in reference to sin, it means to pardon. But forgiveness has also rightly been described as a promise. In Jeremiah 31, it's not to, you choose not to bring it up again. That's what God does when he pardons our sin and forgives us. He removes it as far as the east is from the west. But there's a, there's a willing, there's a choice to not focus on it again. It's not that God has amnesia and he's going, boy, what did Stuart do this morning? I can't remember. It's not that he has amnesia and he has forgotten. It's that he chooses not to remember. And there's a difference. And that's what we have to do when we forgive people, we choose not to dwell on it ourselves. We choose not to bring it up to other people. We choose not to dwell on it. Uh, did I say that? Dwell on it ourselves, bring it up to other people, or bring it up to the person who sinned to hurt them. But this is forgiveness. The best definition is a promise of pardon. Let me just kind of run through this. I might be able to answer some of the questions that might arise here. Uh, God's forgiveness... On page 33, man needs forgiveness from God both before salvation and after. Uh, that's man's greatest need, by the way. It's not for security and significance. <laughs> it's for forgiveness and to be reconciled. The forgiveness needed before salvation can be called judicial. And you can read further about this in Dr. MacArthur's book, uh, J. Adams' book on forgiveness. Both of them deal with this, the judicial and the parental forgiveness. And this is the judicial as far as salvation because God acts as a judge, declaring us righteous forever and delivering us from eternal condemnation. The forgiveness needed after salvation can be called parental because God is now our loving Father who wants to free us from the temporal discomfort of his chastening. Now, our forgiveness... We are to forgive one another just as God has forgiven us. And so when we grant forgiveness to someone, we are promising that we will not remember their sins anymore. And then there's a threefold thing there that is very helpful. Uh, I will not remind you of this sin unless it would be absolutely necessary to do so for your good. That's an interesting um, qualification. Uh, I added it because I believe that you can bring up a person's past sin if it's for their good and help. Not to hurt them, but to show a pattern. All right? For example, if I was coming home on Wednesday nights and I was real rushed, you, know, you, you, you run home and you know, there's a prayer meeting or Bible study and quick, you know, let's, let's, and you sin. You sin in being short with your wife, uh, you, you, in anger, uh, you have unedifying behavior and speech, and you think, oh, I can't go back to church, I have sinned. And so you confess your sin to your wife, maybe to your kids, you ask for their forgiveness, you think, 
uh, boy, poor God, that was grievous. I don't want to do that anymore. Instead, I need to say things that are building up. Does this apply to anybody? It's just a... <laughs> and your wife graciously says, oh, we forgive you. Kids say, yep, yeah, fine. Um, so you go on to church. Next Wednesday night, come running in. You know, it's 5.30. And you're trying to get changed. Where's, where's the dinner? Where, let's hurry up. And you sin again. Same type thing. You know, a little quick comments. What have you been doing all day? You know, <laughs> hey, you know, those kind of things come out and you're thinking, no, that's not edifying. Um, they haven't been laying around eating bonbons all, the, all day. This is, uh, they've been at work all day. But unedifying things come out and you, oh, I did it again. You know, please forgive me. This was sin against God. It was sin against you. And now there's a place where your wife can say, honey, I, I do forgive you. But I'm noticing something. This happens primarily on Wednesday nights, Sunday mornings. You know, there, there's a pattern here. It's almost as if you don't allow enough time. You come in and you want everything done and everyone ready and the kids all clothed, the meal there, and you just want it like, like you could order it through a fast food. It's not possible. We're gonna, well, I'll do my best. We'll try to do this. Maybe if you came home earlier and helped, that might be a, a real <laughs> blessing. Or, or we could budget that we eat something on the way. We could drive through a fast food and eat, you know, in the van on the way to church, and I wouldn't have to try to get supper. Or, now, she brought up past failings, but it wasn't to hurt, it was to help. Let's work at a solution here. So you can bring up things if it's a pattern, and you can say, you know, I know you do want to repent, but it's making it hard to repent when it's the same setup every time. Let's maybe work at some things to change that may help. So when it, it says there the three things, I will not remind you of this sin again unless it's you know, absolutely necessary to help you, or I will not mention it to anyone else. Oh, well, what you talk about damage is when other people um, talk about your sins and you're thinking, where did you hear about this? Oh, your wife told, you know, or husband, or, uh, oh, uh, you don't mention it to anyone else, and you will not allow your own mind to dwell on it. And this is hard. You start nursing um, grievous sins, and you think, you know, yeah, I forgave them, but, boy, that, was, that hurt, you know, that, that was just, that was mean. And, and I believe that's what the Lord's talking about when you are standing praying Keep forgiving. Otherwise, your Heavenly Father, and that's a verse that's questionable in certain manuscripts, uh, whether that's even to be there, whether your Father in Heaven will forgive you for your sins. But that one, it's present active going on. When you are standing, praying, present active imperative, keep forgiving. And it, it's, there's a tendency that you've forgiven and you want to bring it back up. And you want to start not forgiving in your attitude. You already granted forgiveness, but in your heart. And that's the whole point there. God sees that heart. Keep forgiving. And so the assumption almost in that passage of, of um, you have, keep doing it. Now, it says there, whom should we forgive? Some passages in Scripture clearly imply that we can only forgive those who ask for it while others seem to imply that we should forgive everyone who sins against us, regardless of whether they ask for it or not. And that would be alluding to Mark 11, the passage I just mentioned. How can we understand this apparent discrepancy? And boy, you get into this, and books are written on this, right? Perhaps the best way to make a distinction between the transaction and attitude. Uh, the attitude of love, on page 34, now, I can only, I, you know, there's a position Dr. MacArthur takes, there's a position Dr. Adams takes, there's a position Wendell Miller takes, you know, and every person that comes out on this has a, is agreed on many of the same things and then may be different on their interpretation of certain passages on other things. 
But there seems to be in Scripture implied that there is an attitude of the heart that is an attitude of love and is willing to forgive. Now, others, other people that you may read or listen to would actually say, no, you, you do forgive them in your heart. You actually just forgive them in your heart. They sinned against you, and you just say to yourself, I forgive them. I don't see that teaching in Scripture. Uh, I see a willingness to forgive. I see an attitude of aggressive love towards that person that does not end, that will keep you from bitterness. Uh, I see it the same way God is in Psalm 86, verse 5. He is willing to forgive. Well, if he forgave, you, you, if he had a forgiving heart towards everyone, uh, you get into some other kinds of doctrines that uh, I don't think we want to go there. But uh, anyway, here, the attitude of love and willingness to forgive, that I believe is the heart attitude. Even though we may not be able to fully reconcile with everyone who sins against us, our attitude to toward them should never be one of anger, bitterness, resentment. We're supposed to put all of that off in Ephesians 4.31 or any kind of ill will, we should also treat them very kindly and graciously. We are commanded to love everyone, and so we must desire their best, which means we will do everything we can to bring them to repentance, and we will always be ready to reconcile. And so if someone sins against you, it's a clear sin now. We're not talking about preference issues and conscience issues and uh, maturity issues and you know, those kind of things. We're talking about clear violation of God's word. And again, I don't know where you're at in this, and you don't have to take this position. I'm just worked with this thing for years and years and years. Um, it's such important doctrine on forgiveness is how are we supposed to treat other people? And in the church, what do we do? And in relationships and husband and wife and uh, what do you do in the area of sins, clear sins that are committed? Mark 11, uh, I mentioned there that you've got a, a present uh, active imperative, keep forgiving when you stand praying. Uh, some get into other passages uh, that are mentioned there uh, in Luke 23. I believe that is um, Jesus on the cross. Let me just double check that where he said, Father, forgive them. Is that right? Okay. Uh, and if you read Dr. Adams, and I believe Dr. MacArthur is well on that, they're talking about that is um, his prayer request on the cross. Uh, he, it's a prayer. Father, please forgive them. They know not what they do. And it doesn't mean that there was an immediate answer uh, in fruition to that prayer. But 50 days later, uh, the prayer, for the most part, was answered for those that were standing there crucifying him when Peter preached in Acts 2. And uh, they said, you know, you are the ones that put him on that cross. And they said, what shall we do? And repent and believe. And they did. And God forgave them. Same with Stephen when he said, hold this not against uh, them. Uh, referring primarily to Saul of Tarsus. Several days later, God saved Saul of Tarsus. We can conclude from those verses and others that any time someone wrongs us, sins against us, we should pray to God in this way. Father, you know what has happened between this person and me. Help me not to be angry or bitter at them, nor seek revenge in any way, but help me to love them and desire only their good. Please work in their heart. Bring them to repentance so that we can have a reconciled relationship. And use me in any way you can to help them. If they sinned against me, I'm going to go to them. It may not be immediate. Uh, in a husband-wife relationship, when sin occurs, clear sin. I don't know if that happens in your marriage relationship. Uh, but when there is a clear sin, you know, my wife, she loves the Lord, and usually it's within a few minutes um, she acknowledges her sin or she waits, you know, usually within a few minutes. That was wrong. It was not right. And you go back and react. You don't even have to confront the person. 
God's Spirit just working in the lives of his children. But if it goes on for some time and it's not dealt with, it's definitely caused a division. Sin always separates. And so out of love, you bring it to their attention. You bring it up, maybe some questions. You know, exactly what did... It, it sounded like uh, there was a real bite to uh, that comment. It almost uh, seemed very sarcastic. Was everything okay? No, it wasn't. And that was sin what I said. And deal with sin. Bring that... Uh, communion back together. Now, some people will go, oh, boy, you would be doing that all day. You know, if you, if you deal with clear sin, surely there are sins you don't have to deal with. I, I can't find that in Scripture. I can't find clear sins or lists of sins in Scripture that, uh, you know, God doesn't give us, here's a list of things of sins, clear sins, don't deal with these. Cover them. I, I, don't, I can't find that list in Scripture. I can find it in books. I can't find it in Scripture. And I don't say that in a, in a proud way. I'm just saying I, I'm not going to go somewhere where God's Word doesn't allow me to go on that. But if you think to yourself, well, you'd be doing that all day long with people. Not with people that I'm around. I mean, I don't want to clearly sin all the time with my wife or my children. Um, uh, do I sin? Yes, but I don't, I don't willfully do that all day long. She doesn't have to confront me all day long, and I don't have to confront her all day long. We, we don't do that. I, I would hope that's not the case with uh, believers. But I'll tell you one thing, that when you have someone in your life who loves you enough to help you with your sanctification, okay, I don't believe in mutual submission, but mutual sanctification, yes. Now, the brothers and sisters and all of the 38 plus one and others take place in a husband-wife relationship. But when you have people in your life who love you enough that if you clearly sin and you don't deal with it, that they're going to talk with you out of love for you, a love for God, that will, you will, will second-guess yourself before you willfully sin. Right? You, you'll think, I'm not doing that. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just not going to do that. And you know what? That's a healthy relationship. And it's a healthy church when that goes on. It's almost like putting, uh, if you take all of the police cars off the roads, what are you going to have going on when people drive out there on the highway? All kinds of speeding and violations. Now, put one every mile or so. Just park the car. Let the police officer in a, sit in a squad car every mile or so. They don't even have to have their lights on. Just the fact that you know they're there has sort of a sanctifying effect, doesn't it? <laughs> and, you know, that, it, it really is a healthy church and a healthy relationship, marriage relationship and family that says we want to deal with sin, clear sin not preference issues, and uh, you always put the best spin on things. Love does that. It believes the best. Uh, if, if someone bumps into me, I'm not going, oh, what, 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 you know, what's their heart? What's going on? <laughs> you know, you put the best spin on everything, but when you can't, you know, what was said, what was done, I can point to a chapter and verse, it was a clear violation. Whether they intended it or not, I'm not judging their mo heart motives. I'm just saying it was a clear violation and they need to deal with it. For their good, for the glory of God, and people go, well, my, my skin's pretty thick. I don't need to deal with it. It's not about the thickness of your skin. It's about the glory of God. Dealing with sin is more about the glory of God than the thickness of your skin. And, you know, we need to glorify God. We need to continue working at relationships to where we're sanct helping to each other to be sanctified by the Spirit of God for the glory of God. Uh, let me just see. Let me just work through some of these at the very end, and then we'll open it for questions. Let me just go to uh, page 35. Uh, there are other issues that come up about... Uh, you know, whom we forgive, confronting versus covering. Uh, it was last year I did a, um, 
a seminar down at uh, the conference on counseling on the whole aspect of covering. And uh, both, both from the Proverbs, the Old Testament, into uh, Peter, 1 Corinthians, James, where it talks about love covering. Every, every passage I look at, Proverbs, there's four of them, and, and Peter, James, and 1 Corinthians, the covering goes on after sins dealt with, not before. There's nothing in the text at all in context of any of those passages that talk about covering sin and not dealing with it. It's inferring in the Proverbs that if you've covered something, don't uncover it and stir up problems. Or lingering and waiting, don't react quick in your anger. So my conclusion by looking at uh, those passages is that it is talking about covering Love covers a multitude of sins when they're dealt with. Not before. So you don't have to come up with any list of certain sins to cover before dealing with them. Apologizing versus asking for forgiveness. Usually apologizing has a tendency towards self-defense. Uh, it's a... Uh, Sorry, but it's been a hard day. You know, I apologize. Apologize that it inconvenienced you. I apologize that uh, it hurt you. It's not really dealing with the sin. Now, someone might truly be repentant and use the term, I'm sorry, I apologize. You can't, you're not God. You just have to ask enough questions. Do you understand what you did? And it is, are, what you're saying is that was sin and this was right and before God you want to, Oh, sure, that's, that's what I meant. Uh, fine, I forgive you. No, quickly. What about forgiving God? That's blasphemous. That is total blasphemy. Uh, that would infer that God sinned. Because that's what forgiveness is about, pardoning the guilty one. What about forgiving unbelievers? You know, this is a, a tough, I know where Dr. Adams stands on this. I'm not quite there. Uh, I mean, you do pray for opportunities to use. If, if an unbeliever comes up and says, please forgive me, I have sinned. <laughs> I, I don't know if that would happen. I mean, Pharaoh did it, but he wasn't really repentant. But the best unbelievers can do is say, I'm sorry for what they've done. And just pray as an opportunity to talk about what God's done in your life. And that is uh, what they've done against you is nothing compared to where they're at with God. But to say, no, I can't forgive you because you can't repent, I don't think so. I, I think that's really pushing uh, unbelievers. That's all they can do is sin. They are, they're not reconciled with God. Uh, they're not even going to understand sin uh, the way God has intended them to understand it and even change. So I would say yes, but pray for opportunities for the gospel in that. What about forgiving dead people? You don't. Uh, I mean, once a person's uh, dead, if they sinned against you grievously, uh, you know, it's, it's taken care of. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. The, where, wherever they're at, it's taken care of. Okay, so you, it's, a, it's a done deal. At that point, thank God for his mercy in your life and start remembering the good about that person rather than the wrong they did you. Focus on the good things, whether it was parents, you know, relatives, friends, um, but it's, it's taken care of at that point, uh, whether they're in heaven or hell. What about forgiving ourselves? That, that's a psychological phenomenon that you'll read about in some books. It's really not a biblical concept about forgiving yourself. We sin against God, we sin against other people, and I know you can go to the text, I think it's 1 Corinthians 6, where you sin against yourself, uh, your body, in a sexual context there, uh, which could refer to um, sexually transmitted diseases, possibly, but the concept itself about forgiving yourself isn't spoken about in scripture and I'd keep it away from there we sin against God we sin against other people that's clear 
How should we forgive? Immediately, repeatedly, lavishly, just like God does. Quick to forgive, willing to forgive. Repeatedly, lavishly, and we forgive because God has forgiven us. And you focus on what God has done in your life and all the sins he's forgiven you, past, present, and future, and it should be very quick to forgive other people. Now, you may want to ask some questions if someone has sinned against you, depending on what it is or how often. Do they really recognize what the sin is? What's wrong? What's right? And are they pursuing what's right as far as a believer is concerned? But that doesn't mean you're not willing to forgive. Yes, you are. You just want to help them in their sanctification. And again, that's, I just want to be clear. That's, that's the position where I'm coming from. Uh, it's not the, the shared position of others. Uh, don't make this a divisive issue. I would just say be a good Berean and study it out. Uh, to me, the key text was looking at all the coverings, the kafar, uh, covering, atonement. And it is, does any scripture support covering sins, not dealing with clear sins without dealing with them first? Is there any text that really clearly teaches there are certain sins you cover without dealing with them, ignoring them. Uh, and I, I can't find any that in context actually teach that. And then you'd have to use the correlational principle of Scripture uh, about forgiveness and repentance all the way through the Scriptures. And you start carrying some of those themes and being systematic uh, in your theology as well. And th that's just where I've come to. Now, just a c few questions, and then we'll break. Yes. The problem is, is that you say that sin... Clear sins in the Bible are the ones that you forgive people for that we know. But we know that motives, there can be motive sins too, and we can misinterpret a person's motive. So if we confront everybody when we see them and we think motive-wise they're wrong, then we would be pointing out every sin also. Yeah. And so do you understand why you can't really confront everybody on everything you think they're saying? Yeah, and that's a good point you brought up. We're talking about clear actions and violations of Scripture, not motive sins. That's presumption. That's deadly. That, we're to stay away from presumptuous uh, judging. And uh, that's what the Lord was saying. Don't judge heart motives. God does that. 1 Corinthians 4, Paul says, I don't know my motives. Don't you, you know, God will reveal motives in the end. We're dealing with actions. Not, some, not motives. Well, I don't know people's motives. Uh, so we don't address that. We can question that. I can bring up some questions and, and help that individual not just deal with an action, but maybe th start thinking, why did I want to do that? Uh, depending on what the issue is. But I'm not dealing with heart motives as much as addressing actions. That's a good point, John. This whole covering concept, the verse came to mind was uh, 1 Peter 2 in the situation of persecution. For this finds favor for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears upon their sorrows when suffered unjustly. For what credit is there when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure with patience. But if, when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. And, you know, in a persecution, you have a situation where they're definitely sinning against God. And almost, the text is almost saying, just be patient, bear upon earth, there will be a time of when God will truly vindicate you in, in this situation. How does persecution play into this covering of sins? Well, if you're talking about unsaved people persecuting you, right. you know, that's First Peter. Yeah, but believers, uh, if, if a brother sins against you, a brother, go to them. So you would qualify that. Yeah, I think there are passages in Scripture that talk about what to do with unbelievers, and passages that deal with believers. Turning the other cheek is, is an unbeliever. You know, when other people do that, when a believer sins, you go to them. And sometimes verses are used um, and not, not applying to who are we talking about. Yeah. There's also a passage in Romans uh, that, Romans chapter 4, where it says, uh, talking about to one who... Uh, does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is reckoned as righteousness, just as David also speaks of the blessing upon the man to whom God reckons righteousness apart from works. And then it says this, a quote from the Old Testament, Blessed are those 
whose lawless deeds have been forgiven. Then watch. And whose sins have been covered. You know, it's, they're dealt with. They're covered. And then blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into an account. It's just, you, don't, you just don't find that here's a list of things you don't have to deal with that are clear sins. Um, I just don't find that. And so I'm, uh, I don't like doing it. I don't like going to people and talking about their sin. Uh, there are times when I don't like people talking about my sin to me. Uh, but faithful are the wounds of a friend. And when people come and they're, they're, they're trying to help you in your life, in your walk, those are the kind of people I want in my life, you know, that want to help me be like Christ. And I, I linger. I don't just jump on the, the, the issue right away. Uh, just allow the Spirit of God to work in a brother or sister's life. Uh, unless it's a public violation where it's right there in front of people and probably won't be able to gather all these people back in the same location. I think that's where Paul uh, addressed Peter, right there in public. Uh, you're not going to get all those people back together again. This was a violation, clear violation, and he addressed it. Um, so, but thinking, asking questions, make sure you understand, uh, is this right? Is this, is, is this what happened? And then dealing with that for the glory of God. Yes? Back to repentance. If somebody sins and goes through the process of, of this repentance and confronting and asking for restitution and you really believe that person has repented but it's something where they like your Wednesday example where you keep going back right. can you say that person truly was repentant or I mean for that Wednesday example I'd probably say yes but with the guy that went back and started you know living with another right. woman you'd probably say no right where, how do you determine if that person really was I mean obviously you can't see the person's heart but yeah but the whole yeah, there's a process. It's, are any actions taking place to work at change? That's what you really want to look at. Are, are they taking any actions to not make provision for their flesh to fulfill it and it's less thereof? Are they taking any actions, uh, plans to do what's right? You know, is it just verbiage or are they really getting involved in some actions? Uh, you know, a person struggling with internet pornography and they're repentant. All right, are they taking actions to make no provision? Have they ceased? Have they cut off the, uh, uh, the internet capability? Have they got actions? Have they en enlisted help? Uh, I'll only be on the internet at this place. There's firewalls on it. I've taken, I've installed some things. There's fruit. There's, there's actions to put off. There's actions to put on for the glory of God. But in process of some things, for example, if someone, let's say a wife says, you know, I want to remind you of something you, you said you were going to do next week. Did you do it? Oh, I, I forgot. Okay, I want to remind you again. At what point does reminding turn into sinful uh, neglect? You might mean well. And I think it, it's really hard. If there's a reminding here, and a reminding, and a reminding, and a reminding, at what point does it cross over now come into sinful neglect? In other words, my yay is not my yay. Uh, my word isn't. Uh, I'm lacking some integrity here. At what point does that happen? That's a, that's a tough one. At what point does reminding become contentious in the Proverbs? You know, it could have started out just reminding, and now... Boy, she just nags me. Well, wonder why. You know, I, is it really, not that she's free from any sin. Maybe she got to the place, but how about me? And at what point? We're forgetful people. Oftentimes, God, through his spirit, writes passages like, I'm writing this to you to stir you up to remembrance. Because we're forgetful people. And... Um, but at what point does it come to the place? And I think each, each person you just have to talk with and saying, you know, this has been four weeks now that you've said, I've sinned, please forgive me, but I haven't seen any changes. You're not coming home earlier. 
you didn't make any plans on what to do with supper, maybe it, nothing's happening except the same sin. And it, it's, it's brought up to help not to hurt the person with, there you go again, just like last week and the week before and week before and week before. And, you know, that's more of an attitude of, I want to bury you with this thing rather than I want to help you. So it, it's a hard one. You know, what point does it become uh, sinful neglect? Yes? When you discover sin that's been concealed between two other people, uh, do you have an obligation to expose that? For example? Well, but I, I have a case in mind right now of an adultery where the, the one, you know, we, we can confront, but we'll probably get nowhere with it, and then the husband doesn't know about it. They're even in the you know process of divorce and all this. It's a pretty bad situation. But do you have a do you have a responsibility to take what you know and then go and, and uh, uncover that? Uh, I I don't have enough. Um, you know, if I'm dealing with two believers and there's been a, a sin of adultery uh, in their past and they've hid it, they at least tried to hide it, um, not confessed it to their spouse. And maybe years have gone by. Um, yeah, I want to help them with that. Uh, that could be, that is a, such a severe violation of that relationship that um, it needs to be confessed uh, to God and to their spouse. In some situations, I would say in a very controlled setting, uh, they know what they're going to say, how to say it. Uh, their spouse is there. Maybe you can help them if they're a believer to, to try to, to deal with it in a God-honoring way. Uh, what about two unbelievers? And they're already separated and heading for divorce. Um, you know, what they need is the gospel, um, not confessing every sin they've committed. I, I don't even know that would be a, a right confession. I'm, yes, I, I sinned. Big deal, you know. And, and In other words, they're so uh, blinded. They're the natural man, two of them, uh, I would talk more about that person who committed the adultery as their need for forgiveness from God and be reconciled with him and then take care of it with their spouse. So you don't, there's no need to go to the other and uncover that just to say this is what's you know, two, With two unbelievers, it's, that's just one of how many sins. Uh, they, their whole life is sin. You know, if they're living together, if they're whatever they're doing, yes, it's sin before God, but their whole life is sin. Even if they said, okay, you know, we, we uh, confess, uh, he said that they were involved and, and we're okay with that, doesn't make them anywhere closer to the Lord. It, it, it's, their whole life is wretched and they need Christ. I don't think you're going to even see real confession and repentance. You're going to have the Kobe scenario. You know, sorry, but I'm only human. You know, I'm a man. What's a man supposed to do? You know, that kind of stuff. That's the best that the world can do. It really, I mean, that, that is, and, and the other person won't buy that at all. I'm only human. I'm just a man. Oh, come on. You, 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 so that won't probably go anywhere except push him further away. And I would just pray for opportunities for the gospel. That's their greatest need. You see that sin's gone on between two believers. You just you just confront the one who's the offender. Well, if it's between two people, you want to do what Paul told the Philippians to do with Yodi and Syntyche. Wrap around both of them and help them work through this thing. Yeah. Yes. Um, our church has gone through the peacemaker. With Ken yes. And we've been, we've been talking about the covering and that these things. And I know you talked about overlooking. Um, is that what he's getting at? Yeah, that's the same thing as the covering, overlooking, ignoring. Um, and again, some people use that phrase, overlook, cover, and they're talking about preference issues. Uh, yeah, I don't have a problem with that. I'm talking about clear violations of Scripture. I don't see any teaching that says ignore it, cover it. Uh, that's a little sin. That's not a real big issue. Now, adultery, that's a big issue. We're going to have to get involved. But, you know, that was um, 
unedifying speech. I mean, they just cut the other person to shreds, but I can cover that. But this, you know, where do we get into that kind of, of uh, listing when God's word doesn't? That's why people and church elder boards have such a struggle with Matthew 18. All right, well, we're going to adopt Matthew 18. Which sins will we deal with and which ones won't we? All right? That's the, the question on an elder board if they go to church discipline. All right, which ones are we going to deal with and which ones aren't we? And it, it doesn't say because the spirit of Matthew 18 is any clear violation of Scripture that's not dealt with. Uh, you know, it's... Um, you think, boy, you'd be, uh, I mean, if someone was having a gluttonous behavior and wouldn't repent, you would actually discipline them? If they could see from Scripture, this was gluttonous, they're not repentant, someone else has come to them uh, in private as well. Yeah. And we want to glorify God, that's what we're living for, to abide by God's word and submit to it. And you're not policemen, you're not the spiritual SS, you know, it's not... Not like that. It's just we want to help everyone grow. Remove leaven in 1 Corinthians 5. That, that just leavens the whole church. Take care of clear violations. You know, if someone comes to me and says, ah, you know, this happened and it's clear I violated scripture. You want to repent. I said, well, if, if you don't repent, I'm gonna, someone else is going to come with me. I mean, if you get to a place where, yes, I did sin, and I don't care if you or the whole church knows, what kind of person is that? You know, you're acting more like an unbeliever, and that's exactly, you know, the tone of that. Okay, I want to pick up on the topic of replacement. Uh, on page 35, it talks about the concept of replacement, biblical change must involve both putting off and putting on. Now, this isn't just external behavior modification. This is dealing with putting off uh, sin from the heart level as well as actions. It's dealing with beliefs and motives that have to be replaced, uh, repented of, and renewed, as well as actions that have to be uh, the evil actions have to be replaced with the righteous ones. It's from the heart as well as behavior. That's what we're talking about in the area of replacement. It's taught everywhere in Scripture, both Old Testament and New Testament. And you can tell in your own walk, I'm just talking to you, not so much to people you minister to, in your own life and walk, you know when you're repentant. You get aggressive about this sin has got to go. I'm going to do whatever measure. I'm going to go to the nth degree to, to take care of this so I don't sin against God. And you say, well, you know, I mean, other guys don't have to do this, but you do. You know, you will be one of those lame Christians, which, in, in fact, really we all should be, who have plucked out an eye or cut off a hand or, or severed a foot whatever it needs to be, some radical measures in our life to keep away from sin, or at least the, where we're making provision for it. You can't remove yourself from the world, but you can remove the provision and look and say, you know, when I fall in sin, when I choose to sin in this area, there's, if it's a habit, where, where can I put roadblocks? Where can I make it difficult to even go down that path? And then where can I have some facilitators, some sort of divine fans behind me to encourage me towards what's right? It might be that you have other brothers in Christ who say, you know, let's pray together about this. I want to pray that God would help me to pursue righteousness in this area. And let's just pray together. You can ask me anytime. Uh, how I'm doing. Um, and it's, it's taking measures like that of replacement that is critical in the area of repentance, especially when there's habits. You know, a one-time occurrence is something. It's still sin, but it's a one-time occurrence. When you have a habit, you're doing it automatically, unconsciously, and fairly comfortably. And that's what you want to say. I've, I'm 
by God's grace, we're going to get into some mortification here. And if you, you're not going to find popular books today on mortification. It doesn't go well in seeker-sensitive churches. Uh, mortification. You usually have to end up reading some of the Puritans. John Owen, uh, in his volume 6, uh, you can read uh, Christopher Love, the mortified Christian. There's, there's some work, Richard Baxter, uh, others who wrote on mortifying sin by the help of the Spirit of God, taking great measures to radically make no provision for your flesh in that area. And then turn, don't just stay there, you don't break habits, you replace them. Now I need to renew my mind by God's Spirit and His, His Word, think on what pleases Him, what would be the counterpart of pursuing that's right, and be aggressive in going after what's right. I've often thought, you know, for about 12 years of my Christian life, I was trying to break habits. You know, let go, let God. <laughs> um, I was passive. And I, certain habits in my life, I would, it was just like a deep pit. And I'd walk around saying, you know, I don't want to sin. I don't want to sin in there. That, that particular sin, I don't want to sin. I, I don't want to fall in there. And you fall in. You, you just choose to sin. You try to break habits doesn't work. You don't just put off. There's the replacement, which is repentance. So I'm saying there's, there's the sinful habit and the particular sin. I don't want to go there, and here's provisions that I make to get there. Those are going to stop, and putting up roadblocks, people to pray with you, for you. Now you need to turn. Now I'm going to get really aggressive about putting on what's right. And here are things I need to start doing. New friends. You know, these friends, they all participate in those sins too. So, you know, we need to repent. They don't repent. I'm, I'm going this way. I'm going to get new friends, friends that will encourage me in this direction. Uh, planning time differently rather than lingering around where I start thinking about certain sins. Now I'm going to schedule, be very busy about the things of God. It's... It's getting serious about your life rather than, Lord, deliver me and go on. It just doesn't happen. That's a, a very passive approach to sanctification, which in biblical uh, language drips sweat. There's not passivity there. And it gets into the area of mind renewal on page 36. Mind renewal. And this is a key uh, concept in Scripture in the area of sanctification. A lot of passages, Old Testament, New Testament, deals with the mind, your thinking. I could go through pages of Scriptures, Old Testament and New, that talk about the heart and the thinking that goes on in the heart. You know, this is what they were saying in their heart. This is what they were reasoning in their heart. Guard that heart, out of it flow the issues of life. And on and on through the New Testament, you get into uh, the, the Romans 12, 2, about being renewed and transformed by the renewing of your mind. Ephesians 4, 31. I'm sorry, uh, Ephesians 4, 23, which talks about being renewed in the spirit of your mind. And Colossians 3 talks about setting your mind on things above. It's really going after that mind. 1 Peter 1, 13, gird up the loins of your mind. Uh, mind renewal, and so much, uh, as some call it, stinky thinking. There is so much thinking that needs to be renewed. And what I hear people say is, yeah, but what I'm thinking is true. It's true. <laughs> and it, it might be a pretty bleak circumstance. It might be, you know, well, it's true. I don't have the money to continue on in school. Yeah, I, it's true. Uh, this person did this to you. It's true. Uh, I did this last week, or it's true. But that's not the only thing in Philippians 4, verse 8, is it? It's dwell on things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, good report, virtuous, praiseworthy, 
it's got to fit all of these, not just true. Some thoughts people have are true, but they're not pure. They're not lovely. It's not something you want to publish in the paper tomorrow. But it's true, yeah, but it's not of good report. So if there's any excellence, any virtue, you, you dwell on things that conform to scriptural thinking, biblical thinking, and helping people with their mind, their, their thoughts, to start going vertical with them. Where's God at in their thoughts? You know, that's Philippians 4. If you're anxious, boy, go to God in prayer. Bring God into the situation. Uh, God is in control. Go to him with thanksgiving and petitions. Dwell on things that are right and pure, and then practice what is right. But its prerequisite of renewal is to be regenerated, to be uh, born again. That would be a prerequisite. You don't want to have someone start working on their thoughts who's not saved. Uh, that's cognitive therapy. There, I mean, in some ways, we do that in parenting. We're trying to help them think right, and they may not be regenerate. Um, but you'll find in, in time a disparity that goes on to where they say, that's what my parents say, but this is what I think. And it sort of emerges out around age 14 or 15. Where parents go, what is this? You know, they got possessed last week. Uh, no, it's been developed for some time. You've been instructing, doing your faithful duty, but it's God who has to save and help them with renewal. Dr. MacArthur, in his book on anxiety attacked, says this, Since the mind of the lost is corrupt, it doesn't choose what's good. Since it's spiritually blind, it doesn't know what is good. And since its thoughts are futile, it doesn't perform what is good. And since it is ignorant, it doesn't even know what evil it is doing. What a tragic train of thought. Dealing with the unsaved mind. But in regeneration, on page 37, one's mind has a new capacity to be interjected with and controlled by divine thoughts. Now you have the Holy Spirit there to help with the whole renewal. And uh, I, I encourage people, when they have ang anxious thoughts, to write them down. It's not that they're going to be writing 100 thoughts. There's usually, you know, anywhere up around 10 typical thoughts that they're struggling with. I mean, I just picked that number out because it's, it's usually more than five and it's less than 20. It's just, it's not 50, 100 of these things. It's, it's just these huge issues and they keep going around like a broken CD, right? And I have to kind of bring my analogies up to date. It used to be a record, now it's a CD. They'll edit the tape in a few years and be something else. But it's just, it, it keeps circling around. And people go, well, I just try not to think about them. You can't do that. You know, that's not glorifying to God. Take that thought, renew it biblically. Take it right through the scriptures. What does God say about that thought? Change it, renew it. Now dwell on what's right, true, pure, lovely, good report. And you can help people with this, with mind renewal, and it's uh, encouraging to see them take whatever thoughts they're dealing with, anxious thoughts, fearful thoughts, lustful thoughts. And now, instead of saying, well, I'm just going to think about something different. No, I mean, that thought comes into my mind, attempted to be anxious in this area. No, because God's word says God is in control of this. This is what my responsibility is. This is what their responsibility is. And now I'm going to pray, thank the Lord. So it's not saying, well, I'm just going to think about something different. You know, take the scriptures that apply, go right for that thought, and see it renewed. It takes work. Uh, people who uh, have habit patterns of anxiety and fear and depression and lust, it, it takes some work initially to write a thought down, what are the scriptures, work through that process, uh, come out with a renewed thought, prayerfully repeat that thought, meditate on it with the actions that are appropriate, and they'll go, whoa, that's a lot of hard work with just one thought. Okay, now that's, that's right. Now keep that going. Let's go to the next one. 
And before long, you have them have these cards, like you have Hebrew and Greek cards you flip around. They have renewed thoughts on cards they flipping around. I said, boy, here's a, oh, yeah, well, that's a, that's a good, oh, that's a good thought. That was the old one. That is a good one. You know, and they're flipping these, and now they're telling themselves the truth. Things that are true, they're noble, they're right, pure, lovely, good report, virtuous, praiseworthy thoughts, and it's God's word all attached right to it and uh, making that thought. And they're meditating on scripture now. And now they're not anxious, they're not fearful, tempted sometimes, but then they flip those cards up until they have them really moving well in their mind. And now they're trusting God. They're not popping pills uh, for anti-anxiety. They're God's word. They're renewing their mind and heart. They're, they're trusting God's increasing, their confidence in him and his promises. And they're not fretful. It, it, it takes some time, though. And that's why for some who come in, and they are such severe cases of anxiety, panic attacks, depression, despair, suicidal, you don't say, well, listen, stop all this other kind of treatment. Now we're going to start working on your, your thoughts in life. Be careful of that one. It takes some time. You take away you know, a person who might be taking some medication. They might be uh, in some, well, I'm not going to get too specific, but in some areas, and you're saying, you know, God's word sufficient, it is. But they haven't, they haven't worked through that yet. And to say, stop this, which we shouldn't do anyway. Get them into the word of God. Get them growing. And then when they're growing this way, they don't need this anymore. Just some people, they don't even, they don't have anything. Um, and just be careful of that until they can walk through the issues. I'm not after any drive to get people off medications. I want to get them into the word and growing, then they won't need it. But don't just start with stop everything. You just need the Lord. Ooh, uh, that could be real dangerous in some scenarios. Yes? Just a quick question on, I know we're kind of thinking about renewing our minds and taking things and renewing them, but the scripture always puts in the passive. It's always be renewed or be transformed. And where does coming to the Lord and having him renew, and where does our work, I don't know, where's the balance there where the scripture's kind of pushing us towards the passive, it seems like? Well, yeah, you have the uh, passive uh, tense where the Spirit of God is sort of working on us, but then you have the active imperatives on our part to deal with putting on. Uh, but it's God's Spirit who not only, one, helps us with mortifying, right? We, we put off the deeds of the flesh by the Spirit, and we're going to put on what's right by the Spirit. So you have to have God's, the passive work of, uh, we're being acted upon by God, but then the active imperatives where we're dependently at work. Um, but this, the, the, uh, that's a great question. Um, this active work on taking a thought, what is it that I've been thinking? What is it I've been wanting? What should I be wanting with God's uh, spirit helping me to please and glorify him? What should I be thinking? For example, one thought, uh, I use this analogy a lot, but it's, it, it's so vivid for those who are married. But coming home and not wanting to help your wife if she needs help, what is it I'm wanting? Well, it's, it's selfish. I want my time. I want... Uh, relax. I, I mean, uh, uh, I don't want to serve. Well, that's, that's not right. I'm called to serve night and day. Uh, the unprofitable servant does his duty all the time. You, you just, you're a servant all the time, day and night. Oh, well, that's a whole new thought, isn't it? That's a new way of thinking. Okay, so I want to please God. I want to be a servant. So you go home and you see things that need to be done. You have to actually take thoughts of, wait, this is, I just want to go somewhere with a newspaper and relax. And Well, no, I need to think differently. I'm here to serve. That's looking for areas to serve and help, not to be noticed, but to please God. You have to talk to yourself biblically and actually take those thoughts that come in and, 
and look at them biblically, renew them if they need to be, and work towards Christ's likeness. And it's, it's, it's work. Uh, but when God's in it and you keep your eyes on the Lord, it's joyful work. When you think about the Lord helping you and uh, uh, put off the provision for the flesh and put on what's right. So this process and pursuit of renewal, um, there's, a, there's some good writings on that. Whenever you read books on anxiety or fear, uh, the majority of them will get you into the word. I'm talking about people like Dr. MacArthur's book on anxiety attacked or Ed Welch in his book on when man is big and God is small with a fear of man. They're going to get you into the word of God of here's where it needs to be put off in your thinking. This is what needs to change and be repented of and pursuing in your, uh, the, the mind renewal. But girding up that the mind is a key process. I think on page 38, you do have that chart there that shows just the putting off of the fleshliness with the putting on of what is righteous by the Spirit's help. And the spiritual disciplines encourage you, help you towards Christ-likeness of prayer and Bible study and fellowship. God's people are around you to encourage you, and in Hebrews 10, to stir you up to love and good deeds. And Christ-like fruit is manifested. But it's from motives and thoughts all the way out uh, into uh, Christ-like fruit. So hopefully that is uh, helpful. It's hard at first. I just tell people when they say, you know, that's hard work. You know, you're talking about taking your thoughts and working through uh, replacing what I want with what I'm thinking into actions. This whole process here, that's a lot of work. That's hard. Well, that's right. It's, it's hard if you don't, and it's hard if you do. It's actually harder if you don't, and it will get even harder if you don't. The way of the transgressor is hard, and it gets harder. And it's hard if you do. But it's associated with hope and joy and the fruit of Spirit helping you, the Spirit of God and the fruit that's produced. So yeah, it's hard either way. One gets harder, the other gets more like Christ. So there's hope in that direction, there's disaster in the other direction. Well, let me close in prayer, uh, and next week we'll uh, go on to Christ-like attitude. And I just want to uh, help you with this one. Why am I dealing with the whole topic of attitude in pastoral counseling class? <laughs> uh, this gets right into here, what I want and what I think. Uh, I polled uh, the self-improvement projects over the past few years. The number one issue was pride. Number one issue among TMS students was, was pride or attitudes associated with that. Critical, judgmental, um, you know, those kind of attitudes. It's, it's not if we have any, it's just we do. Where is it? And uh, to walk in humility. And that, it's, it's what God will bless and give grace to grow uh, is the pursuing humility. All right, I'm going to close in prayer. And again, those pamphlets are up here if you want those or want to plan on uh, attending that medical seminar. Uh, that might be helpful to your ministry. Father, thank you again for forgiveness of sins through Christ, for the provision on the cross. Lord, we are so blessed. We have been forgiven much. And so I pray that our love for you would be much and would also be much towards others. Lord, help us not to be like that servant who was forgiven much and then wanted to wring the neck of someone who just sinned against them in a little uh, degree, a small degree. I pray that we would be quick to forgive, always willing to forgive, and full of love, your love for other people. Help us to love each other enough that when there is a clear violation of your word that it would be resolved. Lord, for the good and fellowship of your church as well as for your honor and glory. 
Lord, help us as we study your word. We thank you for men that uh, you have used in your church to instruct your church at different eras, and we praise you for them. But Lord, help us to continue to be students of your word, uh, eager to learn and grow. For we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.